Okay, so Jeremy is uh, could be in the first talk, and I see your screen, so it's a good sign. Um, I'll let you. I'll let you get started. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna. So if I go into one sec, if I go into presentation mode here, is that still visible to you? It's still visible. What happens if you go to the next slide? Well, oh, that works perfectly. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, Great. So thanks to the organizers for having me. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some work we've been doing to develop these graph neural network techniques for reconstruction in neutrino physics, specifically in liquid argon time projection chambers. So if you were listening to the talks yesterday, you will have heard a couple of Exatrix talks on, on developing these kinds of graph neural network techniques for tracking in uh, the high luminosity LHC. Um, and this is basically uh, some work to take those kinds of concepts and see if we can apply them in, in a liquid argon TPC to do reconstruction in a similar way. Uh, and something I want to say up top is the structure of this talk is really just going to be me talking about some things we tried that ended up not working very well. Um, and also a summary of what we're working on now uh, in order to try and uh, develop a technique that works well. So I'm not going to be showing any results. I'm going to be talking about the, the things that we tried along the way. Um, so. To give a little bit of context, um, machine learning techniques are kind of a, a big deal in neutrino physics right now. Uh, specifically, convolutional neural networks have, have gained pretty widespread use. Um, so a lot of neutrino detector technologies um, give uh, kind of natural pixel maps as an output of their detectors. So for instance, the NOVA detector, uh, which is uh, one of the long baseline neutrino experiments running currently, um, uses a CNN as its kind of primary event selector to tell apart different flavors of neutrino interaction. Um, Microboon has also uh, developed uh, CNN techniques. You're going to hear a little bit on Microboon later in this session. Um, and I'm going to be talking specifically about Dune, uh, which is a, a future experiment. Um, so CNNs have been shown to work really well, uh, but there are a couple of issues with CNNs. One of which is uh, when you do a kind of convolution over a pixel map, as you can see up in the top right, uh, my mouse isn't showing up, so I can't point. Um, but in the in the top right of the slide, you can see a, a kind of example pixel map from Nova. When you apply a CNN on this and do a kernel convolution, then you're mostly operating over empty space, so it's very inefficient. Um, there are ways around this, so you're going to hear a couple of talks, I think, in this session about sparse CNNs, which uh, get around that efficiency bottleneck. Um, but it, fundamentally, um, CNNs do run into issues, I think, particularly in 3D. Um, if, if your 3D reconstruction provides you with a point cloud as your kind of native uh, representation of the data, then you need to perform a transformation on that into voxels in order for a CNN to work. Um, whereas if you represent your data as a graph, then you can kind of work with the data in its native form. Um, so that's kind of one of the motivations for, for exploring these kinds of techniques. So in terms of what a liquid argon TPC is, um, they're, they're pretty heavily used in neutrino physics right now. So at Fermilab, there are uh, experiments either running or in commissioning, uh, such as Microboon, Icarus, and SBND, all of which use this technology. Um, and the experiment I'm specifically looking at is Dune, which is a future uh, experiment which is being built right now. Uh, but it's going to be an absolutely enormous liquid argon TPC uh, deep underground. Um, and the, the kind of fundamental idea behind this detector technology is you have uh, cryogenically cooled liquid argon, which is inert. And so when a charged particle travels through that detector, it's going to leave uh, ionization electrons behind, kind of like a, a ghostly after image of the, the particle's trajectory. Um, and you place a very high voltage across the argon. Uh, so these, this kind of electron after image will drift from uh, where it is towards a set of wire planes. And so you have three wire planes at different angles. Uh, the, the first two of these wire planes are what's called induction planes, which means as the electrons pass through that wire plane, they will induce a signal on the wires. And then the last plane is a collection plane where the electrons are finally collected. Um, and what that essentially means is you end up with three two-dimensional images of your 3D interaction. Um, the, the timing resolution and wire spacing are very small. So that means you end up with very high resolution images. Um, and because you have this real wealth of information from the high resolution images, then you want to be able to use as much information as you can to reconstruct the event. 
Um, and so that's why machine learning has been shown to work pretty well in these kinds of detectors. In terms of Dune specifically, like I said, it's a 70,000 ton liquid argon time projection chamber is being constructed right now at Sanford Lab in South Dakota, uh, 1.5 kilometers underground. Uh, and so it's in a very low background environment, um, very deep underground. And there's a, there's a uh, you know, just because of the mass of the detector, there's a very high exposure. Um, and the reason we care about this, right, is because in neutrino physics, the, the primary hurdle for us to get over is just the fact that the interaction cross-section of a neutrino is very low. And so the, the, the kind of statistics we're gathering are very small. Um, and so we want to maximize the size of our detector because that just increases the number of events that we see. Um, and this detector is kind of modular. You have uh, four large detector modules. Um, each one of those is 200 individual TPCs. And so you, you can basically transform the image from each individual TPC to combine uh, these smaller modules into a much larger image. Uh, and so that's the kind of data that we work with. In terms of reconstruction, uh, you, like I said, you're reading out uh, waveforms from wires. Um, but you can do some low-level reconstruction on that. So first, you deconvolute uh, your decon deconvolve your waveform. Um, so specifically for the induction planes, because the uh, electric electrons are traveling past the wire plane, you get a bipolar signal. So you deconvolve to get back to a unipolar signal, and then you run Gaussian hit finding. And so you basically transform from raw waveforms to a set of Gaussian hits uh, in wire and time. Um, and then because you have these three representations of the image, you, the idea is that you can then take those three 2D images and, and reconstruct them back to a 3D one. So to change gear a little bit and talk about graphs, uh, at a fundamental level, uh, the inf information structure of a graph is just nodes and edges. So nodes are generalized as some set of objects with an arbitrary set of fe features. And these nodes can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. So you can have different types of nodes if you want. And the edges just describe the relationship between those nodes. And the fundamental idea of a graph network is you're performing convolutions on those nodes and edges in order to learn something about the graph. So you can, for instance, do classification of your nodes. You can do classification of your edges. Or you could do something else, like, for instance, classifying the full graph or running regression on it. Um, in the context of what I'm talking about today, I'm going to focus on node and edge uh, classification. So like I said, the, the uh, motivation for this is the Heptrix uh, investigations, which have now kind of evolved into Xtrix, which you hold, heard about yesterday. Um, a lot of promising results in the LHC world using these methods for track reconstruction. So you can see some kind of outdated plots at the bottom here from the Heptrix uh, paper, which show ed using edge classification to draw these kinds of tracks out in a radial detector, and on the right, node classification to, to draw individual tracks. Um, and if you look at Daniel and Nicholas's talks from yesterday's session, you'll see kind of updated versions of this work. Um, and then this isn't the only talk on graphs and the on TPCs. So Francoise in this session is going to talk later about using GNNs um, kind of at a later stage in processing after applying a segmentation CNN. Um, so I advise you to check that out as well. Uh, but this is focused more on using graph networks for lower level reconstruction. So the, the simulation inputs that I used to, to uh, develop these techniques and explore this in Dune, uh, I had two sets of simulation. Um, and fundamentally, if, if you're not aware of what a neutrino interaction looks like, you have some incoming neutrino, which you don't see, uh, which interacts with a nucleus to produce typically for a charged current interaction, some kind of leptonic and hadronic components. So this is a simple quasi-elastic kind of cartoon on the right here, where you have a new E come in uh, and it interacts in the nucleus to produce an electron shower um, and just a, a single proton in this example. Um, the two samples that I worked with, the first um, was uh, an atmospheric neutrino sample. So it's high, higher in primary neutrino energy. So you get a lot of quite high energy events, high here meaning tens of GeV or higher. Um, because they're atmospheric interactions, they come in at a very broad distribution of angles. And because they're higher in energy, they tend to be higher occupancy. You get a lot of deep inelastic scatters with a lot of hadronic um, particles coming out. And so there's a lot of pile up in the events. Um, and because that's the sample that I started with, I then later moved to a kind of simpler uh, 
set of simulation, which is just charged current quasi-elastic beam neutrino interactions. So those are much lower in energy. You tend to just get out a, a lepton and some small amount of hadronic activity. Um, the neutrinos are all traveling along the beam direction, so there's no broad angular distribution. And, and right, you end up with these pretty clean interactions, typically more, more close to what you see in this cartoon on the right. So those are what I was using. The, the first technique that I looked into doing was something similar to what uh, Heptrix had done, uh, trying to do particle clustering um, by uh, classifying edges in 3D reconstructed space points. So you can see here an example graph where in blue you have the nodes which are the reconstructed space points and in pink you have the edges that you draw between the graphs. Um, and the idea was to classify these edges as, as true or false based on whether the same underlying simulated particle was re responsible for producing them. So for each one of these space points you can follow it back to the simulation to figure out what was happening in truth uh, and use that to define a, a ground truth for training. Um, and so for this technique, I, I applied a version of the uh, Heptrix network, um, which was a message passing network, which kind of aggregates information from neighboring nodes in the graph and then propagates those across edges to form new features on each node. Um, and so the idea is with this type of network, you apply it multiple times. And uh, with each iteration, you're passing information further and further out through the network, which is where this, this message passing comes from. Um, and there's more details on this on, uh, in, in a talk from yesterday, um, so from Daniel. So I recommend taking a look at that. Um, another thing that we looked into was uh, reconstructing the space points themselves. So the procedure of moving from three 2D representations of an energy deposition to a single 3D representation is noisy. If you look at the event display in the lower left, you'll see a muon track. Um, is, is what is simulated here. But when you do this 3D reconstruction, you can see the 3D reconstruction doesn't do particularly well in, in recovering that. So you can see in yellow the points that actually well describe the, the muon track. But this kind of broad, broad blue um, kind of shape around it is a set of 3D space points which were kind of spuriously reconstructed. Um, and so one thing we looked into as well was seeing if we could do node classification um, to, to try and weed out these bad space points and keep the good ones. And so again, we have a space point graph here. And, and you can see the, the muon track on the lower left is from this cleaner CCQE sample. And then you have an atmospheric interaction from the other sample in the lower right. And you can see that that is a much more messy, much more complicated event. Uh, and the real space points there are in green, or the ones that describe the, the truth well. But there's this big cloud of red space points around as well that are, are poorly describing the event. So you can just you can build a space point graph here using a k-nearest neighbor technique to define your edges um, and train a network to do that. Um, and so for this technique, what I looked into was point net plus plus. I think uh, the, the first technique we we were basically emulating what uh, the Heptrix collaboration had done, whereas this network is more geared towards operating on point clouds. So it's kind of a perhaps a better application for the, the kind of problem we're trying to solve. Um, and it utilizes what's called set abstraction uh, to basically sample the point cloud to, to aggregate local features and, and pick out features at larger and larger distance scales, similar to what a UNET does. Um, and so I looked into this. Um, ultimately, I found that the implementation of this in, in PyTorch, this set abstraction and feature propagation, is very slow for large point clouds. And that was kind of prohibitive in getting this to work. Um, I spoke with the, the author of PyTorch Geometric, and it seems like this isn't a fundamental limitation. It's just not optimized right now computationally, and it seems like that is coming. But for the time being, uh, I found this wasn't particularly efficient um, to use for, for the kind of applications we were looking into. Um, and so, like I said at the top of the talk, uh, we don't have any results to show. That's because the 3D approaches we explored, I didn't find them to be particularly effective. Um, I have some training metrics at the bottom of the slide here, and you can see uh, when you compare the accuracies for true and false edges, um, they are a little better than random by a few percentage points, but not by much. So I was only ever, for both of these approaches, able to learn marginally above noise level. And so the next thing we, we are looking into now, after not having too much luck with these 3D approaches, is moving closer to kind of the raw data um, and looking at reconstructing these interactions in the 2D representations themselves. And this is something that's a little conceptually closer to what was done in the LHC. 
Um, if I zip back to uh, these plots from the LHC, you can see that they leverage the fact that they have these sequential detector layers to only draw potential edges between subsequent layers uh, in the in the detector. And when you're working with a dense point cloud, you don't have the luxury of being able to do that. Whereas if you're working in 2D and you have subsequent wire planes, sorry, if you have subsequent wires on a plane, you can you can do something similar where you specify the number of edges uh, based on proximity in, in 2D. Um, and so if I move to the 2D reconstruction here, this is looking at the um, this is looking at uh, the CCQE sample I mentioned earlier. Um, this is an example of an electron neutrino event where you have an electromagnetic shower um, and you can also see a proton coming out from the neutrino vertex there, which is the hadronic component. And you can color code this by the simulated particle and you can see that inside of this electromagnetic shower you have a lot of structure of smaller particles. And so we're looking into whether we can build up the, the kind of relationships between particles within this type of event in 2D using the graph approach. And so if I now flick to a simple new mu event where this is a really nice, simple interaction because to first order, apart from smaller energy depositions, you really just have a long muon track and a shorter proton track. Um, you can connect hits that are adjacent in wire and time with potential edges, which you, can, you would be able to see in gray here, but because this event is so sparse, you actually can't see the edges underneath the nodes themselves. If I then get rid of the nodes and only draw the edges, and if I draw these kind of true edges where, where you, you define a true relationship between two hits that came from the same particle in black and the false one, ones in gray, you can see for the simple mu mu interaction, you have very few potential edges actually, and pretty much all of them are true because you have these nice long tracks. Um, if I do the same for a new E event, this is a little messier, it's higher in energy, and also we have this electromagnetic shower with a lot of substructure. Um, you can start to then see the, the kind of potential in this approach. So if you look at these, you can just about see some gray lines here uh, inside of the electromagnetic shower. But if I now take the nodes away again and draw the, the true edges in black, then you can start to pick apart the substructure of this interaction. And the thing that we're working on now is um, seeing if we can train a graph network to try and pick, up, pick apart the internal structure of this kind of shower uh, and build up a representation of, of this interaction in 2D. Um, another thing we can think about doing on top of that, if we're, if we're doing this within each wire plane, we can uh, kind of as a, as a latest step in this workflow could consider looking at 3D representations by matching those 2D energy depositions within each plane back to the true particle and then using that to draw relationships between planes as well as inside of each plane. Um, one of the things you could think about doing beyond just drawing these kinds of relationships between the views here is also uh, introducing different types of graph nodes. So for instance, a lot of liquid argon TPCs have optical detectors which give you timing information uh, as well as the spatial information from the TPC itself. And you could think about designing a graph that can relate those two different types of information to each other and help you with time tagging. Um, and also, if you're doing message passing, it's possible that if you have a network which can reconstruct inside a plane and between planes simultaneously, those two things may be able to help refine each other. Um, so that's the kind of approach we're thinking about right now. Um, so that's it. Um, I'm a little over time, I think, so I won't spend a ton of time summarizing. But we're looking into these GNNs for liquid argon, for specifically for low-level reconstruction. Um, we tried a few things in 3D, and they ended up not being particularly effective. Um, or at least specifically the things we tried. Uh, so we're now looking at investigating these kinds of techniques for 2D instead. Um, so watch this space for more on that. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, no problem. I, there's time for a burning question if there is one. I do have one, sorry. <laughs> sure. No worries. <laughs> OK, uh, so it, since, since it looks like the 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 spatial representation is your initial problem right? right at least that's what i understand did you try or could you envision some sort of metric learning where you learn um, a representation where actually the graph uh, would uh, would uh, suddenly be really distinguishable between between uh, event types that's uh yeah that's a that's a good question. We haven't tried anything like that, but that sounds. It, it's a complicated. It must be a complicated pipeline because at the end, 
you would have to have a feedback loop between graph building and, and metric learning. Right. But uh, if it's, let's say, reasonably fast enough, one could try to uh, probably try to do that. That's really interesting. Yeah, Th thank you. And we will look into that. Okay, thanks again. We should move on.